Susanna will now talk about natural history uh, in women. Um, and she started uh, the first cohorts that I know she, she did in uh, 25 years ago and has really done some of the major cohort studies uh, in the world. Now. Um, thank you for, to the organizers for uh, inviting me to give in this talk. And um, I think we better move on. Um, my talk is, like Mark said, the uh, natural history in HPV, of HPV in women. But uh, I would like to sort of broaden it a bit to give you a sense of what has happened through the years uh, of this long, long uh, period of investigation into human papillomavirus. I will be focusing on HPV in relation to the cervix. So it uh, actually started uh, some years ago, 50 years ago, where we didn't know that much about the etiology of cervical cancer. But uh, there were several observations, like the prevalence of syphilis is higher in cervical cancer patients. Uh, cervical cancer increased, are increased in, in women getting married earlier. And all this led to the suspicion that cervical cancer might be caused by a factor related to marriage or sexual life. Back then, it was not possible to ask directly about number of partners and uh, AIDS at first sexual intercourse, uh, and how different it was actually back then. I've tried to illustrate. I've uh, actually taken some um, citations out from a uh, book on sexual hygiene written by a Danish doctor back in 1944. And he writes, uh, sexual instinct in boys. An important thing is the fight against the sexual instinct in adolescent boys. From the internal, it arises and takes over the body, and as a vampire, it throws itself on its victim. That's a pretty dramatic uh, perception of sex. And he uh, continues, uh, and he writes about sublimation. Sublimation is a good thing as it means that it, the unwanted sexual instinct is replaced by a harmless and noble activity. Um, sublimation is one of the best tools in the fight against cancer, and, and the sexual, not against cancer, <laughs> what the heart is full of, um, <laughs> against the sexual instinct during adolescence and also later. Uh, and two of the most beautiful means of sublimations are probably gardening and music. <laughs> Very important knowledge, uh, but it also shows you how far we got probably. Um, later on, it was possible to ask about number of partners in the women, and it became clear that number of sexual partners was actually the strongest risk factor for cervical cancer in virtually all the studies. So we went from having a suspicion to be, being able to make a specific hypothesis saying that cervical cancer could be related to a sexually transmitted agent. And there were a lot of suggestions to start with. Herpes simplex virus were, was actually in the focus for a long time, but then came human papillomavirus. In 1974, Dr. Harrison suggested, as you know, that um, these uh, viruses which cause uh, skin, can uh, skin warts may also cause actually cervical cancer. And about uh, one decade later, he actually identified the two main genotypes that we know today as HPV 16 and 18. <clears throat> and for that, as you all know, he received the Nobel Prize in 2008. I would actually like uh, to give you a small and quick uh, overview of in this travel we have been on uh, and what has happened. Because I think it's important to understand how much has happened and how far we are, but also actually what we are still lacking. So in the start of the period, uh, epidemiology uh, was actually very uh, much in the focus. We had the observations that, for example, Cancer, cervical cancer is rare in nuns and common in prostitutes. And we have the suspicion and the hypothesis that I just mentioned. And we had a lot of case control studies studying the etiology for cervical cancer, but still without human papillomavirus involved. Then came the next period where actually 
molecular biology, virology, and so on, played a very crucial role. And we had the simplex virus in focus. We had the new suggestion about the link uh, between genital warts and genital cancer. We have very important, there was a, a technological development in the field which meant a lot. And also we had the identification of uh, low risk and high risk HPV types. And then came, in my mind, a very important uh, period where sort of all the fields starting actually working together. It was a, a period of synergy. Still some technological development was very important with the polymerase chain reaction being used within HPV research. And also, of course, um, the possibility to do HPV serology. This led to the first prevalence studies of HPV in, in a larger populations, and also now case control studies of HPV, including um, in relation to cervical cancer. <clears throat> but most important actually was probably the initiation of the great prospective cohort studies where we have gained so much knowledge about the natural history. Crucial, as we all know, was that the, uh, the discovery and the development of VLPs and thereby the development of the vaccines. And this was followed by the phase one to three vaccination studies, all in collaboration between the different disciplines. And that actually started the possibility that we could think about prevention. Uh, the natural history uh, of HPV and the development of cervical cancer, all this knowledge can actually be, and several have done it before, uh, made into a small cartoon where we start out with the normal cells, and a lot of us get HPV during our lives. Um, it moves on if we do nothing for some of them to precancerous lesions, and again, if we do nothing for some of them, they will eventually develop cervical cancer. We have also looked in several, uh, many, many studies on the HPV prevalence in the general population. And in all of the studies, we have seen uh, the first peak just after sexual, uh, the first sexual intercourse, and then the prevalence decreases with age and stays low, stays low in many populations. However, in some population, we see a second peak in older women, um, and um, there has been a lot of suggestions uh, and explanations for this second peak, and I will come back to that later on. So if we have to extract some important points from all these many, many studies, it is clear now that human papillomavirus infection is one of the most, or maybe the most common sexually transmitted disease, lifetime risk uh, exceeding 80% probably, um, it's most often transient. And this is actually very, very important, of course, because these transient infections carry virtually no risk of progression. And that is really, of course, crucial to know. Some of them, a few, will become per persistent infections. And this is actually the true risk factor for progression to precancerous lesions of a severe uh, precancerous lesions and cervical cancer in some cases. As Xavier showed before, uh, virtually all cervical cancers have HPV uh, DNA in them, and it implies that we have concluded that human papillomavirus is necessary a factor, but fortunately not a sufficient factor for the development of cervical cancer. Also for, from these you could say simple age uh, HPV prevalence curves, uh, we can gain a lot of information. It's pretty simple, um, but what is the explanation for the second peak? Is it a reactivation of a latent infection? Is it new infections? So these simple curves, so to speak, also gives us some information about the mechanisms, and of course, we have also used them to think about how we can introduce HPV in the cervical cancer screening. Then, of course, how dangerous are these types? If, we have, we, if we're going to use them in the screening, uh, we have to look at the absolute risk. What does it mean if a woman is, uh, has a normal cytology, as uh, shown here, and being 
positive or negative to a certain HPV type. In this study, we followed 11,000 women, and uh, at baseline, they were cytologically positive. And as you can see, if they were also HPV negative, they had virtually no risk, or at least a very low risk, of developing uh, CIN3 plus or worse. So, of course, this is uh, the great negative predictive value of a negative HPV test, which is so important in our screening program, um, and it allows us to um, prolong the interval be between the screenings. Also important is, of course, if you look at, for example, HPV 16, these are actually women that were 20 to 29 years at enrollment, so pretty young, um, and still you can see that the HPV negative stays low. But here, if we have women who are still uh, normal, cytologically normal, and having one test being positive for HPV 16, it's a great um, marker of risk, of subsequent risk, and as you can see, if we waited, you followed them for more than 15 years, but here it's up to 12 years, more than 25% of these women will have developed CIN3 or worse during this period of time. Also, HPV 6, uh, 18, 31, and 33 actually convey pretty high risks, but not as high as HPV 16, and it's much higher than the rest of the of the HPV types of high risk. We know that it is persistent, that is the true risk factor, and this can be actually uh, easily seen in this curve. Again, we have followed this cohort. Um, they were followed and examined twice with two years apart. So if we again look at the women who are cytologically normal <coughs> at enrollment, uh, and they are also HPV 6 HPV 16 positive at enrollment, but then we also demand that two years before that they should also be HPV 16 positive. So that is an indication that they have a persistent HPV 16 infection. <clears throat> then you can see that if we follow them for like 12 years, nearly half of them would have developed CIN3 or worse, and that is really a risk that is outstanding and HPV 16 is outstanding. So persistence for this virus is nothing that we, we want. <clears throat> Another very important, uh, <clears throat> clinically uh, important uh, issue is that what do we do with the low risk types? Are they important? Should we screen for them? Actually, several cl clinicians still use HPV uh, low risk HPV in their screening and, and um, what you would do about that. So here we have followed a cohort on 40,000 women. They have been tested uh, uh, for HPV using the hybrid capture 2 uh, method. And as you can see here, we have followed them for, for nearly 10 years. And it is pretty clear that women who have no high, uh, high grade lesions at, to start with at baseline, and being either HPV negative or only having low risk types alone, it means absolutely nothing in a clinical sense in relation to the development of CIN3 plus. So CIN th um, low risk HPV types do not play a major role at all in the development of CIN3 plus, and we do not need to include it, this in our tests uh, in the screening setting. As I said before, um, HPV is uh, necessary, but it's fortunately not uh, enough. So we have been looking at which cofactors could actually play a role um, in the progression. Sorry, in the progression. Um, so where were we? <laughs> the role of cofactors. Co so we have been following a cohort of women who have persistent infection with a high-risk HPV type. And we have looked at what is, um, do we have any indication that other factors play a role for progression among these women? And we have looked at smoking, and we have looked at parity. And as you can see, among these women who are already persistently uh, infected with high-risk types, 
both heavy smoking but also parity means an extra risk and is actually predicting progression among these women. It's nothing that we can use in, in a clinical sense yet, but it increases our understanding on what is going on in this uh, cervical carcinogenesis. Now I will try a button I think is down. It was. Um, so all these things that we have collected, all this information, uh, does it have any clinical implication and has it already reached the women? Because that's really what it's all about. So again, this little cartoon uh, for the natural history of uh, human papillomavirus and cervical cancer. There's no doubt that screening with cytology has meant a lot and has decreased the incidence of cervical cancer uh, around the world. Um, but it's also uh, obvious that uh, cytology is not the only thing that we are going to continue with. It has its limitations and we certainly in the future will include HPV in this testing. No doubt that the vaccination which cuts the uh, cascade uh, very early in the natural history will mean a lot uh, in the world. And all, but also um, in the triage of women with low-grade neoplasia, it has meant a lot. So we can stratify those who are actually at risk and send the rest back to uh, a follow-up at longer intervals. And finally, as you all know, we also use HPV in the follow-up of severe lesions being treated by a cone. So I think it's fair to say that a lot of the knowledge that we have gained has already reached the clinical setting. As Xavier also mentioned, it's not only cervical cancer, but also other cancers, and I won't go a lot into this. Oh, sorry. But it is very important that we see that HPV causes great morbidity, not only in the women, but also in the men. And that means that there's a great potential for prevention, also seen in the light that many, many of these cancers are actually associated with HPV 16 and 18 that are already in the vaccines. I think it's really, really important to underline also in, in relation to what Xavier said, that there is a great burden in the developing countries. And I think we have a great uh, obligation, but also responsibility to, to do something about that, because the, the greatest burden is in these uh, developing countries. To, to uh, end up, uh, I want to say a little bit about the vaccine. Um, in Denmark, we have licensure of HPV vaccination in 2006, like the rest of Europe. And in October 2008, we uh, implemented a catch-up program for women, uh, 13 to or girls from 13 to 15 years of age. And in January, we had implemented the free vaccination of all 12 years old girls. It's uh, not a school-based program, but it's a GP-based program, and we have had pretty high vaccination rates uh, of women within the program, but also women just a little bit older than those included in the program, those who have to pay for it themselves, we see pretty high, not as high as in program, but still high vaccination coverage rates. So we looked at all uh, women uh, who had had, um, and men for that matter, who had had genital warts because we have uh, registers that keep track of all these incidents. So what we looked at was um, on an ecological basis, uh, what does it look like in the co birth cohorts that are actually covered by the vaccines in relation to incidents of genital warts? As, a, as you can see here, the incidence of uh, genital warts really went down in the cohorts with high vaccination rates among the women and nothing much happened in the men. And a much smaller effect was seen in the, in the cohorts that had much lower vaccination rates. So to finish up, we all know that to get from hypothesis, information, our, all our studies, to, to climb this mountain that uh, gives us the results and also do that we can, okay, that we can uh, get it into the clinic. It's, it's really, really, really cumbersome. 
But I think that uh, it is really very important to know that in 1967, something about that, we still had the hypothesis that maybe some microorganisms uh, that are sexually um, transmitted could mean that it is associated with cervical cancer. And now in 2006, we had the licensure of the vaccine. So I think we can say we went from hypothesis to prevention in only 40 years. And in my opinion, it was through collaboration that we did that.